Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of the dream world disaster? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. This case takes place at the Dreamworld theme park, which is located on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. This theme park opened in 1981 after being built by a man who hired designers who had worked on Disneyland and Walt Disney World. It sits on 210 acres and features over 40 rides and attractions. The business expanded over the years and eventually became the largest theme park in Australia. In 1986, the park opened an attraction called the Thunder River Rapids Ride. This attraction was designed to provide a moderate thrill for families. The idea behind the ride was that circular rafts, which carried up to six people, would make their way along a 1,345-foot water-filled trough. The maximum speed of the ride was 28 miles per hour, and the entire trip around the course took 3 minutes and 16 seconds to complete. The trough was about 4.2 feet deep and between 9 and 16 feet wide, depending on the area. Eventually, the Thunder River Rapids ride became the most popular attraction in Dreamworld. In 1998, Dreamworld was acquired by the Ardent Leisure Group, the company, which officially took over park operations in 2003, had a corporate structure which involved many employees working on safety concerns. This included an executive safety committee and an engineering management team. Despite these precautions, Dreamworld would become a world of nightmares. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On Tuesday, October 25, 2016, the Dreamworld theme park opened at 10 a.m. The Thunder River Rapids ride commenced operating with two ride operators and nine rafts. At about 2 p.m., six people boarded raft number five four adults and two children. The riders included Luke Dorset, his partner Ruzba Aragi, Luke's sister Kate Goodchild, her daughter Ebony, Cindy Lowe, and Cindy's son Kirian. Raft number five proceeded along the watercourse until it reached the end of the ride where it was picked up by a conveyor. This conveyor was designed to transport the raft to the unloading area. Raft number six, which was ahead of raft number five, became stuck on steel support rails at the end of the conveyor near the unloading area. Raft number five, which was being moved by the conveyor, slammed into raft number six. Due to this collision, it was lifted and pulled vertically into the conveyor mechanism. The two children on the ride, Ebony and Kirian, were able to escape the raft. The four adults were not as fortunate. All four of them were ejected and crushed in the conveyor mechanism. The two ride operators, some of the customers, and eventually paramedics attempted to assist, but there was nothing that anyone could do. All four adults were declared dead at the scene. In November of 2016, as the investigation into the cause of the disaster was ongoing, the Thunder River Rapids ride was dismantled. In October of 2017, the police recommended that no criminal charges be filed against anyone. In February of 2020, the Coroner's Court of Queensland released a 279-page report that explained exactly what caused the disaster at Dreamworld. Here is a summary of that report. The Thunder River Rapids ride featured a chain-driven conveyor system, which was powered by an electric motor. The system was independent of all other systems on the ride. It was controlled by the operator alone. There were no automatic safety cutoffs affecting the conveyor. In the loading and unloading areas, there were steel support rails designed to prevent the rafts from flipping over while people were getting in and out. These rails were positioned right after the conveyor. There was a small gap between the end of the conveyor and the beginning of the rails. The ride featured two water pumps, which were referred to as the north and south pumps. Each pump was capable of moving a thousand gallons of water a second. 
both pumps were necessary to keep the water level high enough to safely operate the ride. These pumps were extremely expensive to operate. They accounted for about 30% of the electric bill for the entire theme park. The ride featured a series of emergency stop buttons, including one on the main control panel and one in the unloading area. The Thunder River Rapids ride had a few relatively serious incidents that occurred prior to the fatalities. In 2001, two rafts collided and almost flipped. In 2004, a female passenger fell out of a raft in the unloading area after another raft struck the raft that she was in. She fell into the water and was assisted by another passenger. In 2005, three rafts grouped together, which was not a safe situation. In 2008, the raft dispatch sensor malfunctioned. This sensor kept the rafts at a safe distance from each other. And in 2014, the water level dropped after the operator shut off one of the pumps by mistake. This employee was fired, but he complained that the ride was too complex. On the day of the fatal incident, October 25, 2016, the Thunder River Rapids ride featured two operators. The number one operator was a 38-year-old male named Peter. He had two years of experience operating this particular ride. The number two operator was a 21-year-old female named Courtney. This day was her first day working as the number two ride operator for the Thunder River Rapids ride. Her training started at 9.25 a.m. On the way to the ride, an instructor informed her about evacuation points and how to maneuver the rafts with her feet. Once at the ride, the instructor went over a walkthrough of the ride, including various safety procedures. The instructor claimed that she showed Courtney how the main operator panel functioned and pointed out the emergency stop buttons there and at the unloading area. Courtney had a different story. She said the instructor showed her the buttons to press during an emergency shutdown, but never taught her what those buttons did mechanically. Courtney did not understand how the ride actually functioned. The total amount of time Courtney spent with the instructor was one and a half hours. Courtney was then considered to be a certified number two operator of this ride. After that training was complete, the number one operator, Peter, offered some instruction to Courtney as they were getting ready to open the ride. According to Courtney, Peter pointed out the emergency stop button in the unloading area, but said something to the effect of, don't worry about it, no one ever uses it. During the startup of the ride, Peter noticed that the south pump fluctuated at one point and exceeded 500 amps before dropping back down to 420 amps, which is where it was supposed to be. He called for a supervisor who told him to keep an eye on the problem and report any further difficulties. Peter and Courtney opened the Thunder River Rapids ride to the public. At 11.50 a.m., the south pump of the ride failed. This happened when Courtney was being relieved for lunch and a more experienced operator was in her position Electrical workers were able to get the ride running again, and it was reopened at 12.21 p.m. They didn't exactly know what the problem was. They weren't sure why the pump failed. At 1.09 p.m., the south pump failed again and was reset. The ride reopened at 1.25 p.m. At 2.01 p.m., the fateful journey of raft number five began. At 2.03 and 50 seconds, the south pump failed for the third time that day. 20 seconds later, raft number six became stranded on the support rails because the water level dropped too low. Both Peter and Courtney saw this and realized that it meant the ride needed to be shut down. At 2.04 and 50 seconds, raft number five began to travel on the conveyor. Peter claimed that he pressed the red emergency stop button for the conveyor two or three times, but the conveyor did not stop. At 2.05 and 3 seconds, raft 5 slammed into raft 6 and then proceeded to ram into it a few more times as the conveyor kept moving. Four seconds later, raft 5 moved into a vertical position and started shaking violently. It became trapped between the conveyor, which was still moving, and the fixed leading edge of the support rails. Essentially, it fell into a gap and the planks on the conveyor crushed it against the rails. At 2.05 and 11 seconds, the four adults started to go into the water and were killed by the machinery. By 2.09 p.m., 
DreamWorld employees from all over the park were on the scene trying to help. At 2.22 p.m., the first paramedics arrived on the scene. All four victims were declared dead by 2.45 p.m. The report by the coroner determined that multiple factors caused the tragedy. Here are a few of the problems which were specified. The south pump had failed multiple times, but nobody actually knew what was wrong with it. The conveyor was separate from the pumps. No automated system recognized the failure of one component and automatically ceased operation of another. The operator was responsible to spot a deficiency and resolve it without help from automation. Tests showed that none of the emergency stop buttons had been activated, but investigators believed that Peter may have actually activated the emergency stop for the conveyor. If he did press the button, he did so just before the collision or just after. Not enough time to make a difference. He was distracted by removing passengers from the loading area. Peter acknowledged that he never directed Courtney to activate the emergency stop button located in the unloading area. Courtney said that she thought Peter was responsible for shutting down the ride, which is why she never hit the emergency stop button. It seems clear that Courtney didn't have the confidence to safely operate the ride and was not properly instructed. She believed that because Peter was not incapacitated, he would have stopped the ride if doing so was necessary. Courtney's actions were deemed reasonable based on the incorrect information she was given through the poor quality training she received. The emergency stop button in the unloading area was not labeled. There were missing slats in the conveyor, which allowed the raft to enter the gap between the end of the conveyor and the rails. The Thunder River Rapids ride was too complex for the skill level of the employees responsible for operating it. The ride operators were responsible for 38 signals and checks in order to safely manage the ride. The coroner's report concluded that DreamWorld was dangerous, irresponsible, and had inadequate safety procedures. The company may have committed an offense under workplace laws. In July 2020, three charges under the Work Health and Safety Act were filed against the Ardent Leisure Group. They pleaded guilty and paid a $3.6 million fine. The company also paid out over $5 million to family members of the victims, to witnesses, and to emergency responders. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The report mentioned several times that the one emergency button in the unloading area was accessible by the public, as if it would have been normal or customary for a theme park guest to hit this button. I think this is incredibly unrealistic and should not be used as any type of safety mechanism. Do they really believe that a guest would or should feel comfortable pressing an unmarked red button at an attraction? How on earth would a theme park visitor know what that red button was going to do? This sounds like a great way to incur some liability as the visitor to a theme park. Start pressing mysterious red buttons. What could possibly go wrong? For all a customer knows, that button could have been the self-destruct or controlled ejection seats. Item number two, despite the length of the coroner's report, the Thunder River Rapids ride really wasn't that complex. Essentially, the ride became dangerous when rafts were allowed to collide. Stopping this collision involved hitting a button. The training level required to safely operate the ride was not on par with piloting the space shuttle. To be fair to the employees, there should have been an automated system that stopped the rafts from colliding. The ride was poorly designed. At the same time, one of the ride operators should have hit the button quickly enough to stop the disaster. Item number three, the gravity of the disaster was difficult for first responders and other witnesses to process. The bodies were crushed and mangled to such an extent it was immediately clear to anyone with or without medical training that no amount of intervention would result in a positive outcome. Luke had crushing injuries to his neck, spine, and ribs. Ruzba had major chest injuries. Kate had severe chest and abdominal injuries and Cindy had multiple injuries to her head, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Some of the first responders were affected by symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. It was described as the worst scene they had ever witnessed. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? 
This is just a theory, my opinion. The culture at Dreamworld was not centered on safety. The idea of safety became lost in a collection of low-paid and undertrained employees who did not appreciate the lethal capabilities of the rides. Like many disasters of this type, an unfortunate combination of circumstances led to the cause. There wasn't just one factor that caused the problem. In this case, when workers decided to reset the south pump without understanding why it had failed, they contributed the first factor. They knew it was likely the pump would fail again. Other factors like poor training and a lack of automation fell right into line after this. The victims had no idea their lives were in the hands of two poorly trained individuals. Now moving to my final thoughts. Dreamworld had years to update the Thunder River Rapids ride and incorporate new safety technology as that technology became available. Instead, they chose to save some money. They chased short-term profits at the expense of long-term safety. Unfortunately, a lack of investment can sometimes yield dividends as well. Specifically, dividends of pain and suffering. Those are my thoughts on the Dreamworld disaster. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.